Hi everyone, Nigel Saunders here. Today we'll be working on my small bougainvillea forest. It's planted in a 3D printed bonsai pot and we'll be defoliating it today and pruning the forest up. I'll be heading to Toronto for their January meeting and I'll be doing a styling demonstration on a ficus bonsai. Chris Hendry, the bonsai guy, will be bringing the tree. So I'll be seeing it for the first time and I'll be styling it at the uh, club meeting. So it should be lots of fun. The focus of the meeting is tropical bonsai. So I'm bringing along my Schifflera bonsai just as an example of a clip and grow tropical bonsai tree. This tree has what I call its winter coat on. Most of these leaves were grown indoors so they're quite long and kind of uh, raises the canopy quite high. So the thickness of the canopy is more than this tree would have in the summer. So when summer comes, I'll probably prune all these indoor leaves off and regrow a smaller, tighter canopy in the full sun of summer. Even though my Schiffler is one of my largest trees, when you look down from the top, you it has the most surface area, I think, of all my trees. It's not very tall. If I measure, when you measure a bonsai, you go from the lip of the pot, the top lip, to the highest point on the tree, which right now is about here. And you'll see it's just over 10 inches tall, maybe 10 and a half to 11 inches tall, which is about uh, 26, 27 centimeters. So the height is almost within reach of a shohin bonsai. Uh, shohin means tiny thing in Japanese. And this certainly isn't a tiny thing. A shohin bonsai, you should be able to hold in one hand and you certainly couldn't do that with this clump style Schifflera. So even though the height could definitely be brought down to a shohin size, the tree would never be considered a shohin tree because it just is too massive when viewed from the top. It has this huge canopy. It's really wide. A shohin tree usually isn't much wider than it is tall. So if it was uh, 10 inches or 25 centimeters tall, it would also be about the same in the width. And this one is probably three times its height in width. I developed this clump style bonsai from a potted house plant that was just purchased at a big box store. And I've been developing it over the last 20 years as a clip and grow tree. And I'll show you some of the details on it that I'm, I'm quite proud of. This tree still needs a lot more development. Uh, it's just starting to become an, a nice looking bonsai. And I think, you know, as I develop it over the next 10 or 20, maybe even 30 years, it'll just keep getting better and better and more and more refined. I'll talk about some of the features of the tree. The first thing I want to discuss is the asymmetrical design of the clump style forest. The tree is planted over towards the left hand side of the pot. So the center of the planting is about here. So you can see how it's offset from the center of the pot. And the canopy is quite symmetrical compared to the pot. So at first glance, it looks very symmetrical. But then when you look at the details of it, you notice that the planting is longer on this side. That's why it's planted over this direction. So it creates a very balanced composition in the pot, but it's not boring. It doesn't have everything on the center line. So that's a nice looking feature of this uh, forest and I'll continue to develop that in the future. I've purchased very few brand new pots in my life, but this pot is one of those pots that I purchased brand new 20 years ago. This pot and I have a identical smaller one were on sale for half price. There was a store going out of business and the price was right. I, I paid $99 for the two pots and these are Japanese pots, really high quality. And I wasn't sure about the color with this tree at first, but it started to grow on me and I'll explain why. The leaves on a Schifflera are sort of a, almost a bluish green color. And it's very similar to the color of the pot, except the pot is a lot lighter. And I think uh, tonally, the leaves match the color of the pot really well. I wasn't sure about the light color going with the tree at first, but I'm glad it is a light color now because this tree, most of the time with overhead lighting, it's very dark underneath the tree. So even though the trunks are a very light kind of grayish brown color, 
usually they're kind of in the dark under the canopy of the tree. And the pot being a bright color kind of offsets that darkness. If I had a dark colored pot, I think the bottom of the tree would all look like it's in shadow and it would look too dark and gloomy. But I think the lighter color pot kind of, uh, you've got the pot on the bottom that's light colored, the dark trunks, and then the top canopy, which is also a brighter green and in the light. So you get those, you know, going from light, dark, and back to light. And I, I think that works really well with this tree. I think the size and the style of the pot suit the tree really well at the present moment. The tree doesn't look like it's crowded in the pot. The canopy overhangs the edges of the pot just the right amount. I think it, uh, it looks really balanced at the moment. So I'm really happy with the present image of the tree. I talked about the asymmetry of the tree. The uh, planting is offset in the pot and yet the canopy is still looks symmetrical when compared to the edges of the pot. I've also made the bottom half of the canopy asymmetrical. So you can see on this side, the bottom of the canopy is higher. And then as you go over this side, it lowers down a bit. So I don't have that nice straight line going across the bottom of the canopy. I have some variation and I, I think it makes it look more natural. I think it, uh, it allows you room to come in here and explore and look around in this section of the tree. And that's one thing I like about this tree. When you first see it, it just looks like a big green canopy. And then when you kind of bend down to explore it, you find all kinds of features to look at. And I'll show you those now. And here's a close up of the root system on this tree. And I find with a lot of Schefflera's that they're showing too much of the roots. And I think on this tree, it's balanced just right. I want my focus to be on the, the trunks of the tree. I want you to be able to see these nice surface roots, but the focus should be on the trunks and the structure of the tree, not just the roots. And I find a lot of Schiffler plantings, they're planted too high out of the pot. So the whole surface of the pot is covered with the roots. And that's, the main thing you look at, you go, wow, look at all those aerial roots and all those, that wild root system. And you kind of forget about the structure of the tree. That's kind of secondary, you know, other than it may have a nice rounded canopy or something. But this tree, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make it look like a tree you'd see in nature where, you know, there's enough of the roots exposed that it looks wild and interesting. But that's not all you focus on is the roots. They're just one part of the design. So it doesn't, it's not 80% uh, roots and 20% the rest of the tree. I want it so, you know, maybe the roots are a third of the visual impact, the trunks are another third, and then the branches are the last third. So that's the reason it's planted like this, this depth in the pot. I'm not trying to show too much root and I'm not trying to show too little a root. One of the interesting features of a tropical banyan style tree is aerial roots. And you can see the aerial roots on this tree. They're dropping down from the branches. You know, both sides of the main trunk section. Uh, there's some fairly thick ones and they're starting to get their own radial root system. Here's a look at that radial root system. You can see the aerial root drops down. And then I've got some radial roots coming off the base of that, you know, vertical hanging root. So I'll develop that in future. I'll, I'll develop it more. I'll try and get a nice flared base to the aerial root and lots of radial roots coming off it. So it, it'll look like its own kind of tree trunk and it'll go up into the branch. And one of the features when a, uh, a branch drops an aerial root is that the branch tends to stay skinny behind the aerial root. And then the part that grows in front of the aerial root tends to fatten up more. So you kind of get an inverse taper on the branch. And some people, uh, they don't like this. They cut off the aerial roots. It's got to be tapered, you know, thick to thin from the trunk to the edge, to the tip of the branch. And on a banyan style type tree, this isn't the case in nature and it's not going to be the case on my bonsai. I will have, you know, branches starting off thin and then when it hits the aerial root, it'll thicken up. And that's just how they grow in nature. And that's how I want my bonsai to look. And 
It may look strange to people who aren't used to seeing this, but if you studied, you know, ficus banyan trees, you'll see this all the time and it, it looks quite normal and it looks normal to me. Next, we're looking at the trunk and the branch structure. And Schifflerus is grown as a house plant. They tend to grow very straight. Uh, they, they don't grow into curves at all. Uh, the shoots are perfectly straight. And it's only through clip and grow that I've gotten all this movement in the trunks and the branches. And when I first got these trees, I pruned them back to little stumps. And I've grown all that branch and trunk structure in the last 20 years. And so th there's no... Uh, no real straight sections to any of the branches. They've, you know, I allowed this tree to grow and it gets these big long straight sections and then I clip it back and then I allow it to grow again. So I'm getting all this dramatic movement in the branches and the trunks, which gives a really miniature appearance to this entire planting. Because this tree is getting quite old, all the pruning scars on those, you know, all those trunk chops and, you know, pruning over the years, the main trunks have healed quite nicely and they're almost scarless. They, uh, they look quite nice. And that's something that just comes with age that all these pruning marks heal and they smooth over and the trunks get fatter and it just, uh, it makes the tree look very natural. And you know, you get all that movement in the trunks and you can't really figure out, was it wired? How, how, did, how did they get all that movement? And it's just clip and grow in time. The leaf size on this tree is quite large at the moment, and that's because, as I said, it's its indoor coat. Uh, the leaves just naturally grow larger. When the tree's indoors, it's getting less light, so it compensates by growing larger leaves. So when this goes outside in the summer, I can reduce those that leaf size by probably half of what it is now. And usually what I do is, before this goes into a show or something, I will defoliate the tree a good five weeks before the show and I find five weeks gives it enough time to grow in the new leaves and the leaves mature a little bit so they don't just it the tree doesn't look like it was just leaf pruned the leaves kind of have a bit of maturity to them they don't look like they're just starting to grow in and I, I like that look when it's in that stage it just looks right I'm looking at the moss now and I've removed a lot of that moss that grows in around the roots of the tree and they, it starts to climb up the trunk eventually. So I'm trying to keep the base of this tree really clean. And that gives you that nice bark color on the roots. If it's all covered in moss down there, the roots will be a darker color than the trunk. And one of the nice features of age is having those surface roots the same color as the trunk. So I keep the moss away and it also looks more natural. Uh, a big banyan tree in nature doesn't have any grass or anything growing at the base of the tree because it's too shady. Uh, you usually find like a sandy surface around the roots and that's what I've tried to duplicate in this planting. So I regularly peel the moss back keeping it away from the root base and the moss is just kind of around the perimeter of the pot. That was a look at my dwarf Schefflera, a tree that I've been training for 20 years and it's just starting to kind of reach the stage where it's looking like a bonsai. So I'm really looking forward to developing this tree into the future. I think it'll just keep getting better. We'll try and get some separation in the canopy, some variations in height, still maintaining that overall umbrella shape. So I, I think it'll be really exciting. Um, one of the things I like about this tree, even though it's one of my larger trees surface area wise, it's not that big a tree, especially for a Schaeffler or bonsai. And I want to keep it as small as I can uh, within reason. Um, I don't want this becoming a giant, hard to handle tree. At the moment, it's a nice size for, you know, transporting in the car, uh, you know, having on display and indoors. It's not too big, it's not too small. I'll switch now from one of my larger bonsai trees to one of my smaller ones my Bougainvillea forest. This forest at the present time is uh, about 5 inches or 12, 13 centimeters. So it would classify as a mammy bonsai, a really tiny shohin. I create a playlist for all my trees 
So if you want to go back and look at the origins of this little forest, or I'm going back seven years with my Schaeffler here, you can do that. Just go to the playlist tab on the channel and scroll around until you find the playlist for the tree you're interested in. And you can see all the videos on that tree listed in order. So you can follow it from, you know, six years ago to its present time. When you first look at this Bougainvillea forest, you'll notice that the leaves are quite yellowy looking and there's kind of green veins that run through the centers of the leaves. And usually that means like a mineral deficiency. But in this case, it's heat stress on this, these, this little forest. Uh, in the middle of the summer in that greenhouse where I had it kept, it got very hot and it was too hot for this tree. I had it on a shelf that was quite high in the greenhouse. And you can see as the temperature started cooling off towards the end of summer, the new growth came in a nice dark green. And any new growth that's come in since then has been a nice green color also. So I'm going to defoliate the tree today, or all the trees in the forest, and we'll prune up the structure, and then we'll see how the leaves grow in again. They should come in a nice dark green color. This planting definitely fits in the palm of my hand. You can see there how small it is. I'm going to start with the defoliation now. So just pruning off all the leaves. So it'll leave the tree bare and I'll be able to see the structure because it's quite dense with leaves and it's, uh, it's really hard to get in and see what's going on. So to help prune, we'll remove the leaves. And this tree is quite healthy. It's been growing all summer with very little pruning. So it will be fine and it'll regrow those new leaves in. The days are getting longer now. It's getting kind of towards mid-January. So a few sunny days and these leaves will grow in just really nicely. Hopefully we'll get some sun anyway. While I'm doing this, um, I, I've had a few branches from the nearby tree fall on top of the plant room here. And uh, it's getting quite dark with all those branches overhanging the plant room. So I thought I had better get the tree pruners in and prune back the branches on that tree. So I'll show you some of the work they did. It's quite, quite fascinating. Today we have the tree pruners in and they're going to prune the trees that are hanging above the plant room. So you can see all the branches that are overhanging the driveway up there. And last year there's a big branch that fell off and hit the roof and put a big dent in the roof. Kind of cracked the plywood so I want to get all those branches removed. Yeah, so they're hard at work. These guys go up the trees manually. They climb them and then they prune them off with chainsaws and yeah Tim's tree care it's a really good place they're the uh, same place that brings us all our wood chips As an added bonus, the pruning of those branches back made the plant room quite a bit lighter inside. Even though there's no leaves in the trees, the branches still cause quite a bit of shadow in the uh, mid-afternoon mid in here. So that's good. My plants should get a little more light now. And it'll help, you know, I was always getting my eaves troughs clogged up with leaves from in fall when they fall off the branches, so that'll help also. The pot that this forest is planted in is a one of my first 3D printed pots. I printed it at our local library using PLA plastic, 
which is a biodegradable plastic. And this PLA plastic doesn't stand up to the heat very well. There has been some warpage to it, but not very much. It's done really well, actually. Uh, I will be printing future ones using a plastic called NGen. It's next generation plastic. It's not a biodegradable one, um, but it doesn't warp with heat. So it's much more stable in high temperatures like greenhouses and the hot sun. So uh, the library also has a 3D scanner that they just got over Christmas. So I'll be taking some I don't know what yet, maybe some, uh, maybe my root rake and 3D scanning it to make a solid model and maybe printing some 3D root rakes. Uh, I could uh, th 3D scan some mud people and print them out of plastic and paint them up. Uh, yeah, there'll be uh, all kinds of applications for this 3D scanner that I'll think of in the future for bonsai. And we'll, we'll try it out and I'll make a video showing, uh, you know, the scanning process and then making the model from the scan and then finally 3D printing it. So that'll be pretty exciting to do, something new. And uh, it's always nice using new technology and figuring out how it works and how you can use it for your application for bonsai. I'm always open to new technology. I think, uh, you know, You've got to change with the times. You can't stay stuck in tradition forever. I painted this pot to look like a marble pot. I don't know how successful I was, but uh, I just love those marble pots. I think they're the, the best thing. Someday I hope to own a marble pot. I don't know if I ever will find one, but I might have to end up making my own. I don't know. So this is one of the trees that'll go in my new uh, Shohin display. This is, uh, as I said, it's more a mommy style. It's a, a tiny one. So I may even make the display several sizes. So I might make a set of shelves for these really tiny micro bone size. And I might make uh, a larger set for some of my larger Shohin trees which I don't have a lot of, but uh, some of them. I can always start more of them. These trees are pink pixie bougainvilleas, and right up top here, it was just starting to get flowers in. You can see there's two flowers setting there. So it's a shame to prune them off, but uh, I'd rather it flower in the summer than in the winter time. So I'm gonna do my shaping in the winter, let it grow and flower for the summer. Before I finish removing all the leaves from my tiny bougainvillea forest, I'll show you the parent plant. That's this one right here. And you can see the difference in the size of leaves there. At least two to three times larger. And so, yeah, it's quite a difference. This one's growing in a very small pot and this one has a larger pot. This one dries out a little quicker. It uses the water up so it's not quite, uh, doesn't quite have the resources the larger one has in this larger pot. So that's why the leaves are so small on this. I finished defoliating the tree. Quite a pile of leaves for such a small little forest. So there's the forest. It's looking good. It started off as, you know, I think there was four sticks and one of them died. So I'm left with three trunks and it's looking quite good now. I think it's, uh, developing well. So let's have a look at it now and we'll decide what to prune. As I was defoliating the tree, I was looking for insects and I didn't notice any on the tree at all. But as a precautionary measure, I'm going to dispose of these leaves in a plastic bag and take them out of the plant room. It's not worth the risk of, you know, if there's eggs on here or something, of having them hatch and spread to nearby trees. So I'll just dispose of them all. Just like that. I was looking at the planting from the front and it's growing quite well. They've gone from sticks to sort of miniature trees. There's a lot of shoots that have grown really long over the summer and will need to be pruned back. So I'm going to start by doing that. All right, I'll begin. And I'm looking for 
leaves that were facing towards the outside and I'll prune just above those. So directional pruning like that. Um, this one can come back to here. I'm also trying to get a rounded canopy on each of these trees. So that uh, will also influence my decision where to prune. I think I'll prune this one back just a little bit to here. Like that. I'll come out front and have a look now. I'm out front looking at the forest now and I'm trying to make each tree look a little more tree-like so this tree on the right hand side this branch is kind of competing with the the central leader here so I'm going to take that back a bit maybe to here just to make it a little shorter there's one at the back that could be pruned back a little shorter also to there there's one behind the leader that needs pruning back so I'll take this one back to here like that and I think that's about all I can do for that tree on the right hand side let's go to the one on the left hand side now I have a branch here that's kind of crisscrossing the one behind it but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing I think it kind of if you rotate your head around the planting, you can get a good clear view of all the trees. I uh, My apex is quite weak. The, the trunk comes up here. It goes up and then it was cut off. And then there's a new leader coming towards the back. And this area of the tree is getting a little heavy and thick. So I've got to lighten up this branch for sure. You let these other branches kind of catch up in vigor with that one thick branch. So... I'll need to prune those back fairly hard, so I'll do that now. I'm going to take, there's three branches coming from the end of this one here. I, I want to keep my one that's fanning outwards. And I've got one coming more vertical towards me and one behind. So I want the main kind of trunk line to come towards me. So this one's going to get removed and I'll keep the one that's fanning out towards the back like that. I can do some bit of cleanup in here and I'll do that at the end. I'll uh, come in with the concave cutters and just clean up all the stubs from previous pruning. Let's go to the back tree now. I'll rotate the planting around. So again, I guess this is kind of the main leader here. These two branches are getting a little long, so I'll prune them back. To there. This one I'm going to prune back, a fairly hard prune back to here, like that. And this one back to here, like that. I do have two branches that are kind of duplicated here. I could remove this thinner one that's below. Or I could remove that one there. That would give me some staggered branching. This one is quite thick back here. Tough decision. I've decided to take off the smaller one and I don't know if you can see it from that angle. Yeah, I, I'm going to keep that thicker one at the back. I kind of like that division here of these major kind of branches coming up. This I don't think needs to be there. It's uh, I think it just spoils the style of the back tree. So I'll just cut it off rough for now. So here I go, like that. And now I'll come in with my concave cutters and I'll clean up all these cut points, making them nice and flush. I'll clean up this stub here, like that. That was from a previous pruning. Over here, I've got another one. I've got the little Bougainvillea forest all cleaned up. It's looking quite good. Um, I'll keep working on this, you know, in the future, getting more and more fine branching, getting these canopies to fill out and refining the landscape. 
there's plenty of work to do on this little forest for the future. Today I was out to see the progress on the orchard truck. I was so excited last night that I, I had trouble sleeping and <laughs> it's kind of silly, but uh, it's kind of exciting seeing the progress on the truck. So we'll head out to All Equip and check on the truck. I'm out here at All Equip for another truck update. It's been a week since the last one. So let's go inside and have a look. So here's the truck now. The windshield, it didn't come out in one piece, so it broke, so that'll be replaced. Uh, that had to come out to fix the, the top of the roof. There's a hole up there. Um, and there's holes up in this corner too. They commonly rust out in that area. And then the moisture gets in the interior and starts rotting out the floors. So the floors have been replaced here. You can see the new floor panels. They look really good. They're welded in. The corners down here were rusted out, so they've been fixed on this side. And we come around the other side over here. You can see the new floor on this side. Looks really good. This corner down there. So coming along nicely. We're going to remove the old heater. There was a heater in the floor here underneath the rear seat and it's kind of rotted out underneath so they got to fix that hole. And all the heater hoses were all brittle and it's kind of falling apart and showing its age. So that is going to come out. I won't be driving the truck in winter anyway, so we don't need that. Over here, the frame has been sandblasted and it's looking really good. Uh, Everything's nice and clean and ready for paint. There was some trouble over here. If we come way down here, part of the frame has rotted out right down here. So there's a bracket, an S-shaped bracket that came down and sat on top and was riveted to the frame there. So that's going to be, the rivets will get ground off, a new bracket made and they'll reinforce the frame in this section. They'll cut out the rotted part and add a new section there. The other side was better. The bracket's still not great there, but uh, the frame's solid on that side. So that, that'll need a bit of fixing. The other area is these front cab mounts. Uh, this one's the better one of the two here. It's uh, still probably will need a plate welded on top because there'll probably be rust underneath that rubber bushing there or rubber bumper. Over on this side there is a giant hole where that uh, bushing used to be. Uh, I don't know how strong the rest of that bracket is and you can't buy these brackets uh, so There'll be some fabrication work here to reinforce all that and get that uh, made solid. But everything came out really nice. Look at the suspensions all nice and clean now. The springs. Yeah, looks really good. You can see the springs at the back here. All nicely blasted. Yeah, looks really, really good. We'll come over here in the spray booth. There's a, uh, a frame that's painted, and this is the uh, epoxy primer and top coat they use. It's quite a thick paint job. This trailer was really, really rusty. Uh, so it, it's quite rough looking. But here's the top surface of it. It's still a little sticky, but yeah, a good, a good layer of uh, black paint on it. So that's what the frame will get painted. It'll look uh, quite nice when it's all done. Very exciting. That's all for today. I'm Nigel Saunders. Thanks for joining me in the Bonsai Zone.